Good afternoon and welcome to uh, the Budget and Finance Committee meeting for August 4th, 2014. I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee, and I'm joined by my colleagues Mitchell Englander, Bob Blumenfield, and Mike Bonin. And we are ready to begin. Um, we'll be taking public comment uh, on both the agenda items on today's agenda and general public comment. So if anyone would like to offer a comment on a matter that's before us or a matter of uh, generally within the jurisdiction of this committee, please fill out a card and bring it forward. Right now I have uh, two cards and um, I'm going to go ahead and take those cards before we uh, proceed to the agenda items. Uh, they are on item number seven, Ezra Gale, and on item number 10, Ruben Gonzalez. And so if you'd like, uh, why don't you come on up uh, and uh, we can complete that now because we're going to be going into closed session and I don't want you to have to wait unnecessarily. So, uh, Mr. Gale, on item number seven. Thank you, council members. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ezra Gale. I'm with the Central City Association. Today I'm speaking on behalf of both CCA and the Valley Industry Commerce Association with regards to item number seven. We recognize that the area planning commissions are responsible for making important decisions on a variety of land use issues. Uh, and this often requires legal counsel to provide advice on procedural questions. Uh, due to the sometimes complex controversy and controversial nature of land use, it may be prudent for the city to consider its staffing priorities and have council present at APC meetings. However, the city attorney is already stretched dangerously thin, and we believe the city should think about hiring additional attorneys so that resources can address the myriad of demands on the department. Alternatively, given the city's continued uh, fiscal issues, uh, you may consider additional training and education for APC members in lieu of new hires. Whatever alternatives are considered, we strongly oppose the adoption of additional fees on development, at least until the city implements development reform and streamlines the building process. All too often, the city um, looks towards new buildings as golden geese when doing so merely stymies growth, kills jobs, and hurts the tax base. For these reasons, CCA and VICA support legal counsel at APC meetings, so long as doing so does not lead to additional development fees. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just so you know, Mr. Gale, the recommendation is to receive and file uh, the motion because we had dealt with this issue during the budget hearings. And I'm going to, unless there's an objection from any of my colleagues, I'm going to propose receiving and filing that uh, on consent. It's not, to, it's not, a, not an objection, but um, since I was the mover of the motion, just uh, we didn't just deal with it. We actually funded the positions in the budget and yeah. realized that that was a critical need. So those, aren't, those are now positions that are being funded for that role. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ruben Gonzalez with the LA Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I, I come here today to speak in favor of item 10. I'd like to thank Councilmember Bloomfield for his leadership on this. Um, the uh, special uh, lower tax rate for tech companies has been critical in the success of Silicon Beach and the other sectors where uh, tech companies have exploded over the last several years. Um, it's not the only reason. Um, a lot of other variables have added to it, but in the end, when companies are deciding where to start or where to move, they do a strict cost-benefit analysis, and having, having us have a competitive tax rate, a lower tax rate, uh, makes it much easier for them to make the decision to be in Los Angeles and to add to this community and to add to this economy. And so I know you're looking forward to the study. We support the study, get the facts out there, as we always do. But in the end, we need to move with haste, because this is supposed to go away by the end of December. So we need to get the numbers, and we need to make a decision. And we would, of course, recommend extending it for several years. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just so you know, we'll be taking that up after closed session today. So, uh, that, those are all the cards I have. Is there anybody else who has a card, uh, either for an agenda item or for general public comment? Okay, so seeing none, general public comment is closed. Uh, and we're also uh, going to close public comment on our closed session items, uh, numbers one and two. Uh, before we do go into closed session, members, a um, number of our items could be dealt with as consent items unless you, any member would like to pull them. I would propose items 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, and eleven um, as uh, consent items. But if anybody would like to pull any of those, that's fine. That would be the five, six, seven. Office of Finance report on a refund claim number five, <coughs> CLA report about a donation of surplus equipment. Item seven is the well, matter we just discussed, um, which we'll be receiving a filing. Eight and nine are standard Office of Finance uh, investment reports. And item 11 is the uh, um, CAO report relating to MICLA funding on the Convention Center. And in fact, while we're doing this, um, I would also add item number four, the City Attorney Report on Outside Council Expenditures, unless there's questions about that. That's a standard report as well. Seeing no objections. Okay, so all of those matters will be deemed approved on consent, uh, the recommendations approved on consent. And uh, that leaves us with our Next are closed session items one and two, uh, which we will uh, proceed to the other room to consider in closed session. You can stay here. We're going to move to the other room if you're not on those items. So we'll take up item. Does the city attorney have a preference as to which goes first? Uh, uh, Garrett is number one, so we'll go on item number one. If you're not here on item number one, you can wait here. All right. Uh, thank you for your patience. We are back in session, uh, back in open session now, and um, our next item is number three. Number three. Item number three is the City Administrative Officer Report relative to the results of the 2014 Tax and Revenue Anticipation Notes transaction. Is the CAO here? Yes. I could speak to it from here. Or okay. Well, that would be go good. That would be good. Table. We also have uh, our analysts from the debt group here to talk to it as well. Sorry, Baga from the CAO's office. Uh, just an overview of uh, the TRAN that we recently did. We sold the TRAN on June 26th. It was sized at one point, almost $4 billion. Uh, it's one maturity at 11 basis points, which is the lowest we've ever had for the city. We did very well. Uh, it was a negotiated deal. We had uh, We had, sorry, um, Ramirez as the senior underwriter, um, and the deal has the highest ratings that we've ever had for short-term notes, so we did very well. And just to add to that, um, part of the reason why we issue the trend is for two purposes. One is for cash flow purposes, because a lot of our revenues do not come in until the later part of the fiscal year, um, including property tax, which is the largest part of our revenue source the general fund. The other reason is to get a discount on our pension payment. So by paying um, on July 15th of the year, we, uh, both systems for fire and police pensions and lasers, we are saving $35 million based on, on that prepayment to the system as opposed to paying it on a biweekly basis. $35 million in savings annually because of the prepayment. Exactly. And what's the cost of money for doing so? Um, in essence, uh, through this deal, we are actually making potentially $4 million because of the proceeds being deposited with the, our treasury um, and uh, the returns that they're getting on their investments. Uh, not only will we save $35 million, but uh, make 40, uh, $4 million on the, uh, in interest. Sounds like pretty good news. Yes. And what was the part about uh, the city's... Um uh, 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 creditworthiness that you just mentioned a moment ago. Oh, that, that we we received the highest short-term ratings that we've ever received for these for the notes. Okay, Mr. Blumenfield. I mean, it's obviously great news and, and wonderful to see this kind of thing happen with the with the cost, the yield at 0.11 percent, which is amazing to get. Are there other opportunities in addition to paying down? Uh, the pension, or pay, paying early the pension, which makes complete financial sense. Are there other things that we could do with such a low co when money costs so little 
that we could do to save money. For example, um, you know, our police overtime. There is a cost of money for the police overtime. Uh, and granted, that's over a longer period of time, but if it, when money starts getting so cheap, there are things like that could, could come into play that we could either make money or, or you know, or, or do some, some substantial uh, dents on some of our long-term problems. Are there other things that you're exploring or that we can explore? to use the low cost of money to help us with as a city? The only program that we would have access to in order to use for those kinds of purposes would be our MICLA program. So there are certain limitations on that, that, that we, you know, there are competing priorities for, for MICLA financing. So it would be something that we could look at in the greater scheme of the other uh, policy objectives of the council. Um, everything else would require a vote We'd be using, you know, like a general obligation bond, or if you're looking at a sales tax bond, all those kinds of um, bonding mechanisms require <coughs> voter approval. And just to add to that, we actually did uh, submit a, a budget memo on this uh, during the budget process with respect to using commercial paper for for things of that nature, uh, specifically police overtime, as you mentioned. What we found then uh, in assistance with our financial advisors was that, in essence, what the city would be doing would be turning a, a, um, a soft liability, if you will, into a hard liability, whereas uh, police overtime, while we consider, do consider it to be a liability, does not appear on our books um, as, as a f you know, hard liability as opposed to how debt appears on our financial books. Uh, and so there is a cost associated with that in that you know, it increases our, our our, um, or decreases our capacity, our debt capacity, and um, you know it's it just could determine what cost, if anything, we would we would um, incur. The other thing is that commercial paper is, is just a very short-term tool. Um, so I can speak a little bit more about that, but how we use it, uh, in essence, we we use it in the short term, and then until we find a a longer-term vehicle to to move those uh, that debt towards. And, and I get that for the longer term issues of the, of the overtime, but for the short term issue, you know, we know we're going to spend X amount this year on overtime. And if we, you know, if we just clear that bank day one, then whatever step increases and other things, that, which is in essence the interest we're going to pay over the course of the year, we would avoid. And as long as that's less than the 0.11 percent, then we'd be making money. That. Well, I mean, I think the difference between what you're, you're talking about and, and the trend transaction is that we pay off, you know, it's a one-year maturity, so it gets, off, it gets paid off within that one year as opposed to longer-term debt that would require multiple years, and then that, you know, that's a different, um, that's received differently in the market. And as Mr. Mr. Bonner, any questions? Thank you very much. It's very good news, and uh, it will be the action of the committee to note and file the item. Uh, that brings us to item number 10. Item number 10 is a motion, Bloomingfield to deal relative to instructing the Office of the Finance and Economic and Workforce Development Department with the assistance of the CAO and CLA to report with the comprehensive analysis of the impact and effectiveness of ordinance number 181127, which temporarily reduced the internet-based tax rate, including recommendations whether to continue, modify, or terminate the current reduced internet-based business tax rate as enacted in 2010. All right. And uh, Mr. Blumenfield, this was uh, your motion. Would you like to open up the discussion on this? Sure. Sure. And, and, and I know other folks on this committee are interested in and have had an interest in this. This idea came to me as some companies actually in my district um, were worried about the fact that this, this was going to sunset and that it was a tool that they were used to keep them in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, so w wanted to look into the idea of how we can maybe extend this sunset um, before it, it ends, um, but to get the information, because we always want to make sure we're doing these things in a financially smart way. Um, so to get a report back, and, and maybe to ask for a report back within, within a short period of time. I, I understand that that's not unreasonable to get it back within two weeks because there's been a fair amount of work that's already been done. Uh, figure out what kind of businesses are actually included in this, um, in this uh, internet ta uh, business tax. Um, 
the other kinds of, you know, to, to get the data so we know what, if we do want to decide to move to relax it, which my intuition is that we do, that we have, we're able to move forward in a, uh, in a smart way. Mr. Bonner. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Blumenfield for, for bringing this motion forward. This is uh, something I worked on back in my days with Mr. Rosendahl. And uh, I'm happy to see the data gathered and come forward. I actually don't think I personally need to see it. I think I see it every day. Uh, I have seen since this past internet businesses move from Santa Monica or El Segundo or Culver City into the city of Los Angeles. Uh, I've seen them because of this uh, hopscotch into our city and, and give us more jobs. Uh, it is, I think, the uh, one of the, the, the bigger employment bases and centers on the, the, the west side now. And it's now part of the Los Angeles city economy as opposed just to the, the Santa Monica economy. And I think that's a, a, a huge thing. Uh, I'm eager to see us do this quickly, and I'm glad you're asking for a, a quick report back. We've got companies that are talking about lease agreements now on the west side, and you know, they're weighing whether or not to be in West LA or Santa Monica. One of the companies that sort of started the discussions about this back in 2010 was Shopzilla, which is literally on the border of West LA and Santa Monica. And when we put this in, we were able to keep them in the city of LA, and I think their lease is coming up again. So I want to make sure we, we, we don't lose them. So if, if this is going to come back in September, and, and we're going to, will we be able to hear this in committee in September if they uh, get the report back? We'll absolutely make that commitment to expedite this as quickly as we can. And, uh, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm willing and happy to have us also at the, you know, at the same time direct city attorney to uh, start working on the appropriate ordinance to sunset it so that Excellent. we don't we don't lose the time, uh, but we know what the costs and the benefits are. I mean, clearly they're benefits. What is it actually costing us? Uh, because you know, are are we talking the scale of hundreds of thousands? We're talking the scale of tens of millions? Um, that makes a difference as we consider uh, costs and benefits. Yep, and I, and I hope that when they do this, they'll consider um, uh, to the extent that they can that. Uh, when we get some of the bigger companies that move into LA, that creates uh, an economic environment where we now have uh, incubators and uh, uh, accelerators that are popping up uh, throughout Silicon Beach on the west side, creating even more jobs. And once they graduate from these incubators and these accelerators, one of the things we're trying to do is keep them uh, here in the city of LA and, and not take the skills they've learned here and then go somewhere else so they can help us continue to grow. So uh, I was going to ask uh, if we can start work on the, the ordinance, so I'm, I'm very glad to, to hear you say that. Thank you. So we, we can fold that into the motion and sort of have a dual purpose. One is to direct uh, the CAO to come back within two weeks to, to report on uh, the economic analysis, and then second, we can have the city attorney uh, begin to prepare an ordinance. Which we, which we can also consider depending on what uh, you know, the analysis yields. And, and then, you know, the other thought is we may want to at some point, and I know Mr. the chair has thought about this, look at the bigger, because the, the, the report we're going to get back is going to be fairly modest in scope. We may want to take a bigger look at this issue along with some other business tax issues or technology tax issues uh, on a longer term basis, um, you know, for next year or something to that effect so that we can get a sense of that. So you're here to tell us that's all doable, right? Uh, I'm here to tell you that most of it's doable. Um, some of the uh, requested study information cannot be conducted by the Office of Finance or our office. That would require going out to an outside consultant, which would sort of delay it. But we can certainly release a report answering the questions about how much it's costing the city or uh, the kind of businesses that are claiming that exemption. Yeah. If. I mean, we can wait for the two weeks to see what happens, but if, if it comes back and we're not going to have enough information before the end of the sunset, I'd request that we uh, uh, extend the sunset by a year or two while we can do the bigger analysis so that we don't lose this in the meantime. From my perspective, I'm going to jump around, Mr. Chair, but mm -hmm. that's fine. I mean, my perspective, that's a reasonable approach, which is we get the what we can get within two weeks. Um, we look at it, and if we think we need some additional information, which we very well may, depending if you're not really able to do the economic, the bigger economic analysis, we at least extend it by uh, a year at that point, and then we do the economic analysis during that time. And yeah. 
that way it's a it's a win win type of scenario, but we get the information that we need. At least that that I would certainly be my my recommendation. And, uh, Sounds good. Um, yeah, if I could, and, and just putting my arms around this in terms of um, first, I want to thank you for bringing this uh, motion forward as well. Whereas um, you know, I believe in uh, trying to streamline and make the city more business friendly as much as possible um, in every category and, and, and um, overall as much as we can financially uh, given the difficult time we're having growing out of this recession, eliminate the business tax um, altogether for all industries. Uh, if we start looking at individual industries and what we can do, every step, everything we do in every single industry is helpful. Um, what I'm trying to figure out is how we would actually isolate this particular industry to come up with some of these numbers. Um, it seems to me that internet-based businesses uh, probably have, in some regard, a lot less overhead, perhaps, than uh, brick and mortar. Okay, so the kind of information that uh, the Office of Finance is able to provide is those businesses that claim that code that allows them to qualify for this particular tax structure, and then they can provide us with the information of gross receipts that they report and then the taxes that they pay as a group. But beyond that, that would require additional analysis. I, I just from my, 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 my gut check reaction on this and looking at the motion and some of the things that we'd be studying and some of the conversations that has brought up, I mean, this asked the CLA and the CAO to look at um, a number of types of businesses in the category, an estimate of the total number of employees, the business's total gross receipts for each fiscal year, total tax revenue by fiscal year, broad analysis of the economic impact of the tax policy decision. I think it boils down to the spirit of perhaps where the motion came from. These are businesses that can locate anywhere and move on a moment's notice, um, and that a place where we need to be incredibly competitive in the space. Uh, from, and I guess they're coming up with a new name for Silicon Beach. I think that's still being brainstormed somewhere. Uh, there's, there's debate over whether or not that's a popular term. Okay. So, in any event, um, you know, whether it's Warner Center, Chatsworth, Northridge, Silicon Beach, um, Sunland, Hunga, wherever they're based, they can move anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. And so, this is a big decision for them on where they're going to locate and how competitive we're going to be in the space. Uh, so, I'm all for whether we need additional studies and we try to figure out how to isolate to justify um, even moving this further to extend uh, the sunset. I, I'm all for eliminating the sunset, but to extend the sunset, um, I think we should, we should do it as soon as possible. And um, I think the study should include, um, if it, and I don't know how you'd quantify this, but how many businesses have chosen not to be in Los Angeles because we're not business friendly, particularly in this space, or how many have moved out to other neighboring jurisdictions because we're not uh, competitive enough, but I think that's impossible to quantify. Yeah, and I, the Office of Finance does not have that information. I mean, in terms of, you know, the employees or uh, the economic impact, that is something that would also have to go outside the office. Uh, Robert Lee, Office of Finance. Uh, CEO is correct. We collect tax measures. We can collect uh, information on that, but we do not have the ability to collect how many individuals are in each of these entities or where they are, or a lot of the information that's here. So even though we can't give the specific statistics that we have to CAO to assist them in this, we and CAO do not have the ability to do the analysis beyond that detailed level. That you uh, I, I think there's been enough widely reported, and we know um, well enough that if, if we don't, if we're not competitive, and, uh, and we don't offer these opportunities uh, to these industries that they're either not going to stay here or they're not going to come here in the first place. Um, so I'm all for And extending. you guys also don't generally have the conversations with the CEOs or the founders uh, trying to, to, to get them here to know uh, this guy decided, no, I'm going to go to Burbank or Santa Monica, uh, that this company decided to come to L.A. That, that's not part of the information base you have to provide us, right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I guess I just want to say, first of all, that this has, uh, the concentration on internet-based based business has been a tremendous success, and thanks in large measure to Councilmember Bond and Andrew predecessor, and this mayor and the preceding mayor who focused on, on this issue. Um, and it, it's just been a, a tremendous success, and, and 
that's to the benefit of the entire city and the people that live here. So congratulations on all that we've accomplished. And, and I am wholly supportive of Mr. Blumenfield's um, not only motion, but the spirit behind the motion, which is um, while we have to make every effort to be competitive, we also have to make sure that the policy making that we're doing is in fact what is necessary to be competitive. Because one of the things that some of the results that you're talking about will not demonstrate is causality. Mm -hmm. And um, it's true that some internet businesses might be coming here to Los Angeles and not in Santa Monica. Some of those might make a decision because of uh, the business tax. Some might make it because of other reasons. Some might make it for any number of reasons. And the same goes for any other business in, in Los Angeles. There are myriad decisions, decision points that go into that citing decision. And on the flip side of that, there are, there's a wide range of ramifications of that in terms of economic benefit. Whether or not the employees of this com for example, an internet based business that sets up on one board side of the border of Santa Monica as opposed to the other, um, they're going to have the same employees and their employees are going to live in the same places. So the number of employees that that business has is really irrelevant to our decision making or should be. Whether or not that business is generating sales tax revenue is highly relevant to our decision making. Whether it's generating other kinds of revenues that are received by the general fund of the city are highly relevant. So, my point with this being that every business is going to be different, but we need to, as a policy matter, we need to be in the practice of making sure that we're um, making our policies based on actual data, and we can only do that if we do the, that kind of uh, analysis. So sounds like we have, uh, yeah, Mr. Bloom. Yeah, I think, I think we're, we're going toward a consensus, but I hear us talking, and maybe you could clarify just to help sort of publicly get out the, the kinds of businesses that we're talking about because it's, um, you know, it's not necessarily e-commerce businesses, it's, it's internet businesses, it's, uh, if you could help clarify the kinds of businesses that are included under this code section. Um, well, what we're trying to do is, uh, if I'm understanding, you wanted m more detail as to what's under the 2114 under C and D. Uh, yeah. under well, I, I think people are this? thinking of different things and we're not talking about the Amazons of the world are people who are selling product, but we're talking about internet-based. Yeah. Oh, well, we could follow up and give you some more information on, on that. Unfortunately, if you want the technical specifics, it, it falls under 2141 under C and D. Uh, I don't have it with me, but it, it goes into how they do business and the monetization of their revenue. But at this point, regarding the this specific focus, what we're doing is individuals that are applying within the city of Los Angeles that might have an existing classification other than 2141, we are analyzing, we are reviewing what they're doing and confirming that they do fall under this classification based on the ordinance. If they do fall under the classification, we are going ahead and moving them to the new classification as opposed to the original one. The new classification is the higher? Uh, lower, the 2141. Otherwise, if a, if if an entity comes into the city of Los Angeles and they're classified <coughs> under the professional services, 2141, and they believe they should be under the 20, uh, excuse me, 49, and they believe they should be classified under the 2141, they would complete an application, send it to us. We would analyze what exactly they do, and based on the information, we would determine whether or not they class, uh, qualify for the LL 2141 or they should remain under the 2149. So at this point, once they qualify for the 2141, the rate would be from the professional services, which is at the 5.07. It would be reduced to the existing 2141 classification of 1.101. So there is the internet. This relief gives them the rate from the 507 to the 101. Did you, you wanted to add to that? Um, I guess the, maybe a, a more simple way to explain it is there is a larger classification under this new classification based on our report that we wrote last year. It applied to only about 56 businesses and a lot of them did like data manipulation. It didn't really apply to all internet businesses. So there was uh, two categories that were developed um, and uh, so by the, the smaller amount that it applied to it actually had a very limited impact on the effect to gross receipts. Okay, so uh, is there any need, 
Has the discussion been captured in terms of uh, the recommendation? Because we've kind of gone back and forth a little bit on this. I want to make sure you're clear on. Uh, well, for clarification, agreement. do you want to continue the matter in committee for those for the initial first two week report and then send it forward to council or? Yes. So continue it. We get the report back. In two, it's what I'm recommending. Get it back in two weeks. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're asking the city attorney to come up with the ordinance so we don't lose any time. So, so today we're giving that instruction to the city attorney to begin working yeah. on, on the so ordinance. That, so that we're not losing any time <clears throat> in the process, but we are going to be able to hear the two concurrently at our next session. Okay, and the ordinance that is being requested is for the one-year extension? Yes. Okay. That's... I believe so. Thank you. Everybody good with that? Yep. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. That will be the action of the committee. That brings us to item number 12. Item number 12 is the Office of Finance report relative to approval of a second supplemental agreement to contract number 107276 with American Express Travel Related Services Company. Good afternoon, Officer. Good afternoon. Saul Rumo with the Office of Finance. Uh, I could give you a brief overview of why we are here with this extension, or if please. you would like me to just this to is open the up second the time we're here on an extension on this, so please do, because I, 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 I have a concern, and not just about this contract, but we do frequently, we, we get into a situation where we're presented with an extension of a contract because it's about to expire and we need to act. So. Um, we have been in a contract uh, agreement with American Express since 2004, and we, had, the Office of Finance has gone through a series of annual amendments. In a recent amendment that we came before council uh, about a year ago, uh, in reviewing possible extensions, it came, it came, we came to the realization that there are some protections that we normally afford the city through its contractual process that were not part of the existing agreement with American Express. And in order to afford the city the protections and build, incorporate those elements into the agreement, we needed an extension. The state of California had at that point um, completed a year-long um, negotiation process with American Express as part of um, their contractual agreement. We pondered whether we could uh, potentially use that agreement. Um, that agreement didn't afford adequate protections to the city as we would like. And so we've spent a good part of the year reviewing um, city um, contract provisions and negotiating with, um, with American Express on, uh, on some contractual provisions. We've been in discussions with the city's Bureau of Contract Administration on the relevant applicability of some of the city's administrative code provisions on this agreement. We've been involved in discussions with the city attorney on issues of risk management involving indemnification, limitations on liability, and insurance requirements. Um, so we spent a good part of the year with, with American Express going, th going through a checklist of items, and we're now in the stages where we are reviewing drafts and wordsmithing, so to speak, the, the agreement. It was our intent to have the agreement executed by this time. I would say that we were close, but in, with the abundance of caution, knowing that, we, that with some reviews that would still have to review, be done by American Express and obviously by our, our legislative review process, we're now here with that extension. And just again, it may seem like it's been a considerable amount of time, but again, to put it in perspective, the state of California in a similar negotiation with this company is taking about a year. And there has been some unique situ changes with American Express in that since the initial contract was negotiated back in 2004, the nature of, bank of banking has changed. Um, there are some federal laws that now apply to American Express because they have become a bank holding company. They're unique relative to uh, Visa and MasterCard. And so as a bank holding company that is now subject to federal banking laws, American Express was looking at some of our contract language and the protections the city was wanting and, and looking at those very closely, especially in an era of issues such as cybersecurity. So it's complicated the discussion a little bit more, but I think we can, we can confidently state that from a business standpoint, we're at a good place now, both, a, both um, agencies, and we're now at the at the wordsmithing and the redlining phase of the agreement, rather than dealing on, on business elements, whether they're going to be deal breakers or not. Okay. 
What if we were to only accept MasterCard and Visa from now on and not American Express? I'm sorry? What, what if we were to only accept MasterCard and Visa? Um, what would be the impact of that? Well, the impacts would be, first of all, we collect about $700 million in credit card transactions in the city. American Express represents roughly a little less than 10%. We collected in last year $68 million worth of transactions through American Express. Where, where we would have to do some of the math is the, the rate that American Express is charging to the city relative to the rate that is being applied by Visa and MasterCard. There is potentially a smaller sa a savings that um, we could be obtaining by using American Express because of the rate that they're applying to us as a government entity. The American Express rate is, is fixed. It's pretty standard, whereas when you're dealing with Visa and MasterCard, their rates depending on a number of variables, it could be, uh, their, their list of rates are about 10 or 20 pages long. Um, what we found with American Express is our biggest users of American Express are Department of Building and Safety, who obviously collect transaction fees on behalf, behalf of other departments, and LA World Airports. I think what you're looking at is as a matter of convenience for your taxpayers or some of your business entities that use the visa I mean, the, the American Express as a corporate rewards card, it's more providing them with the flexibility to use that card and get something in return. Um, that's not to say that you can't do the same with Visa and MasterCard, but it simply limits the options to individuals who are paying to the city. Sure. sure. Has the controller uh, done any independent assessment of uh, this contract or, or its benefits that you know of? I know it was initially as I understand, the initial contract was entered into by the treasurer under the treasurer's authority without council uh, approval, which is not necessary under the treasurer's authority. So council hadn't really had a chance to weigh in on this contract until it was just extended uh, over the years. So um, I'm wondering if... if to that my knowledge, no, they have not. And obviously that's one of the review cycles for what, why we want to build in the extensions to make sure that there's an adequate and appropriate review by... Our, the CAO is part of the review process through the Office of the Mayor and obviously through the legislative process. And we just think that if we hadn't come to you with this extension, we would be, time would not have afforded us that opportunity. Okay. So if we approve the extension, we can still move forward through the CAO, through the Correct. controller, through other, um, uh, th through other sources. We can do further work in determining whether these charges are reasonable, whether they can be negotiated uh, down, whether they are even cost effective to uh, continue to accept as opposed to some other forms of, of payment. That, that work can continue yes. uh, so long as, as the brief extension is, is granted. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any questions on this, Mr. Blumenfield? Yeah. Um, sort of a, building on your question, a similar one is how it compares to Visa and MasterCard. And what I heard you say was that it's hard to compare because they have variable rates. Well, so, so does that does that mean that American Express, in in some or many cases, is is a better rate? Uh, in some instances, it can be a better rate. Yes, and uh, I think we would have to do some of the some of the permutations and calculations to give you a better sense of how much we would be saving. But um, they do provide a flat rate to uh, the city as a government entity that is much more favorable than, let's say, if you were to provide it to a merchant, a restaurant, <coughs> a, a travel agency, uh, an airline. So there's no, there's no slam dunk answer in terms of what's best for the city in terms of what we use or don't use? No. no. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else, members? Okay. So... Um, the proposal is to uh, extend the contract, but, and I, I think without objection we'll go ahead and do that, but I would also ask that finance report back uh, on a regular basis, say every, let's say every two months, uh, on the status of your continuing negotiation with American Express. We'll do so. All right. Anything else? Is that, that'll be the action of the committee, and with that, there being nothing else before the committee, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.